Matthew 11 verse 16 says, So what shall I compare this generation to? Jesus says, They're like children. They're like children. They sit in the marketplace and they call out to one another. He said, John came and he was neither eating nor drinking. And they say he was a demon. Because he didn't eat nor drink. He spent a lot of time fasting and praying. And because he did this, they said, he must be a demon. The son of man, Jesus, whenever he spoke of himself, referred to himself as the son of man. And the, that was Jesus' title for himself that comes from the book of Daniel. That the son of man will come. So he's actually saying, I am. Every time he referred to himself as the son of man, he was saying, I am the fulfillment of that promise in that book. He came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him. He's a glutton and a drunk, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So, if you do, you're a demon. <laughs> and if you don't, you're a lover of sinners. So you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. This should feel about how you feel about being a believer. You speak the truth, who are you to say? You agree with a lie, <laughs> you compromised. You can't win. If I agree with you, then why are you agreeing with me? If I don't agree with you, who are you to suggest that I am wrong? If this is your life, then that's about right. If you feel like you, you can't win, no matter what you do with your faith, then that's about right. You know, we prayed for the country this morning. We prayed that the Lord would do something about the country. But you know what? Are you ready for God's response? Do you know that God's solution to South Africa is you? Not somebody else. God's answer for every problem in the country are the children of God. And that is why judgment always begins in the household of God. Now in the last few weeks, some of the messages that I preached were quite hard messages. They were hardcore. Um, I'm surprised that you kept coming back. <laughs> I guess you were between a rock and a hard place. Because if you didn't come, we would ask you, where were you? And if you do come, we say, are you still comfortable? Like... Our leader this morning said, are you comfortable? And everybody said, yes. And I thought, not for long. <laughs> the first week of July, I spoke about taking a position of blessing. And we repositioned ourselves in the service. Then I spoke about not living in fear. No fear. The Spirit was telling us not to fear. So the Lord was saying to us, you need to take a position of blessing. You need to reposition yourself. You need to come and understand who you are. And then you also need to fear not. And then I said to you that fear not appears 365 times in the word of God. Once for every day. Because every day there will be something that you'll be confronted with that will cause you to fear. But don't be afraid. For God will be with you. And he said to us, don't live in that fear. Take the correct position. And then last week, the Lord said, you can't earn love. What shall we compare this generation to? Now, before I go into this, um, I'm just going to say that generations are defined in ways, biblically, but generations always cross over. So for one tribe... You may be part of a particular generation, but that may not be the same time as another tribe would be celebrating a different generation. So but when two tribes come together, the generations cross over. So God is a God of the generations. The God, of Father, God the Father of the 
father of all nations. He's the, so he's the God of Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. A multi-generational God who looks at your situation not only through your life. Some of the promises he made to Abram came through Isaac. Some of the promises he made to Abram came through Jacob. And he wasn't even around when God fulfilled those promises. Some of the promises to Abram are being fulfilled now in your life. So you may be praying for your children. You may be praying for your grandchildren. You can even pray for your grandchildren's children. Because in God, they are already known. So when you pray for your sons, when you pray for your daughters, put your faith in God. Release them into the life that God has given them. Sometimes what we do is we think that we need to make sure that they understand things the way we understand it and then they'll be okay. No. They will not be okay just because they understand things the way you do. Because if they understand the things the way you do, you are one generation too late. So many of us in this room, if you've been in church long enough, would associate yourself as baby boomers. Now baby boomers are the generation that came after 1946. When, when the war killed off so many people that people started having big families. And so there was a, there was a culture after 1946 called the baby boomers. All those people needed to do was have babies. It's why the Lord invented televisions. To stop the baby boomers. To stop the baby boomers. Now it's very important that generation were regenerating the population of the world. Because the Great War, sometimes also known as the Second World War, it wasn't a world war, it was just a war, a great war that was fought by many nations in the world. And it became known as the World War because it affected so many nations far and wide. From the east to the west, north and south. In England alone, all the children were moved out of England and sent to the colonies. South Africa, Canada, Australia, and many other took the children of England and housed them here while the war was fought in England. South Africa then sent soldiers to fight in that war, and many of them died fighting for that country, fighting for the nations, and bringing about a change in the history and the future of the world. But when the war was over, those children were sent back to England. Through, with ships and over a hundred thousand children returned to England after the war coming from Canada Australia South Africa hundred thousand kids arrived there all of them orphans and that's when England became a nanny state the state took care of the children now till this day in England the state has more rights over your children than you do but that's where it comes from. That's the generation that brought about the nanny state. So generations provide us an opportunity to see things in a different way. To see things in a collective. Because you know what? The study of the, of the various generations helps us understand world views. Helps us understand the views of a whole cohort of people. And so people come. That, when should we retire? Should we retire at 60? Should we retire at 70? You know, the life expectancy of people changes from one generation to another. In the time of Jesus, if you lived to be 45, you were an old man. You were an old man. Many didn't make it past 30. Right now, called the millennials. Now the oldest millennials are actually 38 years old. The oldest millennials are 38. Right about now. Josh, you're almost there, eh? <laughs> and they are well into adulthood. So the millennial generation was, was really started... Um, you know, after the what we then call the baby boomers and then the Generation X. Now, I was born in the Generation X. That's after 1965. After 1965, if you were born after 1965, you were considered Generation X. So, <laughs> Wakanda forever. So now we're speaking of a post-millennial grouping. And here's the amazing thing. The post-millennial group, their oldest in their cohort, are 22. So if you're born after 1996, 
you are not part of the millennial grouping. You're actually part of the next generation, Gen Z, or the I Gen. Okay, so these are some of the names given to the next generation. The Gen Z, I Gen, Homelanders, they call them all these funny names. But what has become the next generation is the Gen Z. Now, what is the thing about, okay, maybe, maybe if we were in America, it would be called Gen Z, you know? Um, <laughs> These things are not an exact science. But what they've done is they've, they've formed the various generations and they look for a natural transition. A natural transition. So children who are 22 years old and 23 years old are born worlds apart a year later. So in South Africa, there's the born freeze. The born freeze are born after 94. And these born freeze are not all that free because the country hasn't really empowered them to be free isn't it amazing that the generation that was born free feel more trapped than any other previous generation they come into households where the parents are overprotective where the schooling system teaches them to question everything and when they question things at home they just get a A bit of education. <laughs> so, so Jesus says, so what will we compare this generation to? Now, here's the amazing thing. The question asked 2,000 years ago is relevant today. What shall I compare this generation to? Jesus' answer is, I will compare them to children. Children in the marketplace. Children in the marketplace. Children in work. How modern a problem is it to have child slaves? Children in the marketplace. And right now it's not so popular to go swish, Nike. Why? Because when it was found out that they were using child labor to make their garments and to prepare their shoes and suddenly we realize that slavery is a modern trend, is just more sophisticated. And Jesus didn't come for us to settle for these things. Jesus didn't come for us to say, you know what, what's going on out there has got nothing to do with the church. Let me tell you something. Jesus came to say, the kingdom of God is breaking into the kingdom of this world and I've come with a message, good news. God wants to set you free from what the world is trying to bind you with. So what is this generation going to be facing? They're going to be facing real issues. Because one of, one of the things you need to understand, if you're going to be a believer of Jesus Christ going forward as a Gen Z, I feel it should be Jay-Z, but, <laughs> but we'll just leave it as Gen Z. But the Jesus generation needs to understand something. The world is going to become more and more intolerant of your faith. What was once a popular thing even in the United States, there were more Christians in the United States than in any other country. In the United States, Christianity defined the law. But what actually became the thing is that to be an American meant to be a Christian. And then Christianity was associated with being an American. You know? And so when people shouted, USA, USA, it was like, you know, that's the image of Christianity. But then we discover that is not the same thing to be an American and to be a believer. Because right now, there are two worlds in the United States. Those who are part of this generation who are celebrating women in a very different way to which the church celebrates women. We don't celebrate women just to compare them to men. We are celebrating women because they are children of God. And we are coming. Jesus was one of the rabbis that changed the phenomenon of the religious understanding of women. And every time, every generation, there is a tendency for men to push it back to the way things were. And so that is why in the church, there's always a tendency to want to go back to the old thing. 
And the tension that we must live in is that God is moving us from the old thing into the new revelation of who God is. Now, that doesn't mean he's a new God. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. But you need to push through, push through the veil that the world wants to put over your eyes. Jesus would not be popular today. This world will crucify him again. Don't think because we live in a modern world that crucifixion was something that just for that generation. I want to say something to you now. If Jesus came today, we would crucify him. Because the things that he would say would go counterculture to everything that we believe. And so he came to a people that he created. He came to a world that he formed. He came to a people group who were calling for the kingdom of God. And when he came, they couldn't see it. So what will we compare this generation to? We need to understand each generation needs to take hold of what it is that God has called them to. I'm thinking of Genesis 49. When Jacob was praying for all his sons and he was towards the end of his life and he was blessing each of the sons. And he came to one of his sons, Issachar. And he said, Issachar is a strong ass. A strong ass. Couching down between two burdens. He prophesied that over his child. I mean, can you imagine your father blesses you? The last thing he says to you, you got an ass. You a donkey. And we from today we'll call you big ears. <laughs> now that again, be very careful when we associate the imagery, but he was saying, you a strong ass, but you're gonna be so stubborn. But you will carry the burden on both sides. Now, what is amazing for me is that years later, generations later, the sons of Issachar became a whole tribe. And they lived in the northern part of Israel. They lived in the northern part of Israel. And so when the Bible says the sons of Issachar, they're not just talking of his two biological children. He's talking about the generational children. So when he blessed his son, he blessed him not just to this generation, to the next generation, but through the generations. He said, your children will be stubborn as mules, but they will always take a position of strength between two different sides. You see, you prophesy that of your children, hundreds of years later, what happens is this. Two kings are called by God. One is the first king and one is the second king. And God anoints the second king for the next generation and the first generation says, he can't live. And so Saul starts persecuting David and he takes a position where he wants to totally annihilate his seed. He wants to get rid of him before he can become anybody. And David is on the run and he runs into the region of the caves. And what happens is this, God starts sending him men for his army. And this is what was said of one such group of men that attended and came to the cave to sign up for his army. Of the sons of Issachar, there were 200 men. And they were men that had understanding of the times they were living in. The sons of Issachar are the generation that understands the time they are living in. They understand the tension of the one king being against the other. And they take their position in the middle. So his children literally stood in a position of strength between David and Saul. And they did this at Ziglag. And as we know, Ziglag was the place where God eventually gave it all back to David. So what do you understand? about what was prophesied over your life? What do you understand about the Lord, what the Lord has called you to be? What do you understand about your purpose in the kingdom? Because we can't be like those who don't know what is going on in our generation. A king will never call you into his, into his court to get advice from you if you've got no good advice to give. Esther chapter 1 verse 13 says this, The king consulted the wise men who knew the times. 
for it was customary for him to confer with the experts in law and justice you know there comes a time when the king consults and when the king consults will he consult you will you be consulted will you have an understanding of the time that you are living in i believe as a generation whatever generation you yourself have been born into whether you're a baby boomer a gen x whether you are a millennial or gen z it doesn't matter to me all of you are in the room the question is do you understand the time that you are living in do you understand that jesus understands that we are called to be in the marketplace as his children and when we go into the marketplace as his children do we understand why we're there because when we pray when we speak we must not expect to be to be to be welcomed by Saul we mustn't expect to be understood taking a position of strength means that you must take sides against what is wrong you must stand up for what is right even if it means that the spear intended for David goes through your heart. How stubborn are you? Okay, don't answer that question. But we need to be in a position where we are standing for what is right. And sometimes when you stand for what is right, you'll be singled out to be rebellious. You'll be singled out to be a rebel. And it will be said of you, it will be said of you that you stood with them. Because you must remember when there are two sides, there's a culture created around you. It's called them and us. And there's a boundary between the two. So the question is, where will you stand? Now as believers in Jesus Christ, our position is on the boundary. And it is the most dangerous position. But we become those who stand on the rampart, on the boundary, and we wait the orders of the Lord, and we take our position and stand for what is right. But we also become a doorway for those who seek and hunger after righteousness. So irrespective of what side of the boundary they're on, do they recognize that they can come to us? Like the lifestyle leader standing here today, now you know who takes their position on the boundary and they are those who are standing there um, and, and trusting the Lord for change so Jesus' invitation is this I praise you Father Lord of heaven and earth because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to little children you know Jesus says this generation must be like children in the marketplace but it's children in the marketplace who will get the revelation of God and the revelation will be hidden from the wise and the intelligent because one of the things that stops us from speaking truth is that we are too wise or we are too intelligent all things have been handed over to me by my father Jesus said no one knows the son except the father and no one knows the father except the son and anyone to whom the son decides to reveal him come to me if you are burdened come to me if you are weary and I will give you rest take my yoke upon yourself because I am gentle and I'm humble in heart and you will find rest for your soul for my yoke is easy to bear and my load is not hard to carry now every rabbi every rabbi in the time of Jesus every rabbi today has a teaching and his teaching becomes the teaching that yokes you to the shoe and Jesus says every rabbi has a teaching and that teaching is a yoke so the yoke what Jesus was talking about was the teacher of the rabbi he says there are many rabbis in your generation and they are all teaching something they're all teaching you he says and some of the things that they're teaching you are putting a heavy on you they're putting a heavy on you they're telling you that you must not do this on the sabbath and you must not do that on the sabbath you can do it the other six days but not on the sabbath and it's not only sin that we're talking about some of the things were things as simple as eating you know some some rabbis taught things like this on the sabbath you may not spit on the ground because spitting is work and you may not work on the sabbath so you must swallow it otherwise you're sinning now that's ridiculous 
the law just the law simply said remember the sabbath and keep it holy and paul says this don't go beyond what is written so what what a lot of rabbis do is they take what is written and they add their two cents worth and that's when you start to get religion so jesus says i came to remove religion and bring you freedom so that you can have a way back to the father so that you can be children in the marketplace and you'll have something to say and you will confound the very wise so i want to say to you today church i don't only say this to kind of tickle your ears when i say you are the solution to our country's problem but you can't be the solution if you're in the marketplace and you speak in a different language other than a kingdom language so a kingdom language is not a them and us language a kingdom language is a my father language our father as we sang this morning hallowed be your name your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven this is the language of the children of god let it be here like it is in heaven lord let your kingdom come and the lord says take my kingdom to them take my kingdom to them and they will do to you what they did to me don't expect them to treat you dignified don't expect them to treat you well you go and take them the good news that there is a way that's better than the way things are today now i've got a lot of confidence in a lot of people i even love some of the politicians that we have in politics at the moment i love them some of them are hard to love some of them are hard to love but the moment we develop a them and us language we lose our right to speak because then we speak in like the world so when we speak about the problems in our problem in our country are we like nehemiah we send word to find out what's going on and then we go on our knees and we say lord we have sinned against you we have sinned against you the country is not in the position it is in today because of jacob zuma or the guptas i'm serious it's not in the position it is today because the anc is in power or that the da is in power in cape town the country is in the mess that it is in today because the church has been silent on earth as it is in heaven why are we so worried about what the world thinks of us we need to be the people of god that we are called to be and we don't live in judgment we live in love the economy of the kingdom is love and the economy of jesus is love for god so loved the world he loved the world so much that he sent jesus because the kingdom was not letting the people in we had signs on the door that says you may not go beyond this point we had signs on the door that says women cannot go beyond this point we had signs on the door that says only gentiles can be here and no further than this and if you go to that point you will die and then they even lied to the people and said that the glory of god is behind the veil and when god tore the veil it was empty on the other side you know religion is empty always has been always will be but i have come you may have a life and you may know it in abundance so do not let fear stop you from being the person that god has called you to be whether you belong to the baby boomers and you're finding yourself in the years of your life where you just want to go and retire and relax you can go speak to the cars there there's no such thing about retirement and relaxing i believe you're going to be 80 this year, in your next birthday and you're going to take a break from your husband when you go to scotland <laughs> the lord bless you How old are you now, Malcolm? Uh, 79, 80, are you retired yet? 
No. Okay. Listen to what I'm saying. 79, not retired yet. Purpose. It's not finished. God's not done with him yet. And I can tell you this, the enemy tried to take him out. Once he was driving down Main Road and a car came through the red robot here at, 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 in Plumstead and they teed him right in the middle. He had a gash from year to year. When I went to go and visit him, he had just a big scar and he was smiling and he says, don't worry, I'm okay. Don't worry about me, I'll be fine. He was working with a gash in his head. You know, the enemy is going to come after you. He's going to try to take you out. He's going to try to finish you off. But you know what? There's no retirement in the kingdom of God. You can retire from your job, but you can't retire from your purpose. Turn to somebody and say, you can't retire from purpose.